I want to welcome you uh, from here in the Northland, wherever you might be watching this. This is a special sermon uh, that I prepared for as we near the ending of our CHIP, the Complete Health Improvement uh, Program that we're doing in Grand Rapids. And I thought it would be appropriate to do a sermon on health and how God's design for us helps us to live a more healthy, holistic life here on this planet. So before we get started, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this time that we have to study your word and to look specifically at this topic of health. Lord, I just pray that you will uh, bless us as we study and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've titled this sermon, God's Design for You. Now, I need to give you a little bit of a, a background of where I'm coming from, because also, as we speak, I'm getting ready to go to a um, Adventist Health Systems retreat and talk about how uh, world religions uh, view sickness and healing. So I've been studying uh, Buddhism and Hinduism especially because I used to live in the Muslim country, so I'm well, more well acquainted with Islam and obviously as a Christian, more acquainted with Christianity, the largest world religion. So I've been studying that and, and what's interesting to me is that each world religion takes health seriously and healing seriously. And as I've been studying the Buddhist and the Hindu religions, they believe in the, in the, the Eastern concept of samsara, of this never-ending cycle of life and, and death and rebirth, and which sometimes we call it reincarnation. And it's based upon the principle of karma. And you kind of, you get what you deserve. So if you're on the path to enlightenment, which is what is considered to help you overcome all of your illnesses, is enlightenment and understanding. And, and in Buddhism, for instance, one of the great truths of Buddhism is that there's suffering. And so you try to... Uh, empty yourself of yourself and attachment to other things to help you overcome this um, truth that we experience called suffering. But I, I was reading an interesting story and one of the Buddhist kings asked a Buddhist monk, he said, well, you know, what happens when you get sick? Is this karma or is this just because I'm not enlightened and I haven't gotten rid of my, my myself, my ego, my, my I? Um, and the monk struggled with it. And he said, well, really, you know, there's no way to know. Only the Buddha, uh, who was actually a Hindu at one point, and that's why they're so close in, um, you know, their belief system, it, only he was the one that overcame suffering. So we can't really tell if, now you're sick right now because you, had, you have karma and you, you're, you're being taught this and you, you can't get over it. So it's a tension in Hinduism and Buddhism. How much of your ailments, your, your disease is caused by karma and how much of it is not by your enlightenment and how much can you get rid of and how much can you not get rid of. Also, I was studying Islam and uh, the Quran really doesn't talk much about this, but especially in the Hadith literature, the traditions of Muhammad, um, sickness is viewed as a way of God willing it. Number one, he wills it. And, you know, in Islam, we, they say, inshallah, if God wills it, which sometimes we say that also in Christianity. Uh, and the Bible actually talks about that. But when you come to sickness, is that you, you start to wonder, well, is this God's design for me? I mean, he, he gave me this sickness. And is, is it help, helping to purge me of some of my imperfections and sins? So this is the background that I've been wrestling with as of late looking at yeah, how much of sickness and health is related to what we've done, um, what we believe in this life, Islam and Christianity teach in this life, or in, in Hinduism and Buddhism would even go back to past lives that we've had. So we're going to look at this from the context of the Bible and we call, I'm, I titled the sermon, God's Design for You. So we start in Genesis 1. This is the baseline for me. When I approach scripture and when I approach health, you look in Genesis 1 and you look at everything in creation. Everything was good. God created this, it was good. Day 1 was good. Day 2 was good. Day 3 was good. And, and the crowning act of his creation was Adam and Eve. 
they were to look over this whole world and they were to uh, be the rulers of it. And they were to be good stewards. Obviously, God was the ultimate ruler. But we looked there and there was no disease, no death. This was never in God's original plan that, you know, Adam and Eve would get the flu or have a cold or, uh, you know, get hepatitis A or cancer. We see none of that in, in Genesis 1. So if we're looking at the heart of God, this is the baseline. The heart of God is that, yeah, there would be no sickness, no death, no pain. You get to Genesis 3 and you see what? In the fall, you see after Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, disobeyed God in the one test he gave them. And God has to be um, just and he allows them to go their own way and their choosing and his presence is removed, uh, you know, as it was in Genesis 1 at least, from the earth. And all of a sudden we have death and destruction. We have sickness. We have people that don't live forever. They, they begin to die. Uh, they lived quite a long time, but then we see even after the flood in Genesis uh, chapter 6 through 8, we see that they began to live, you know, only around 100 years. And now we're down to, you know, anywhere from 60 to uh, 80 years old is the average, you know, around the world. So we see that after God's order is destroyed of Genesis chapter 1, that this is what really causes sin and, uh, or suffering and sickness and death. And we see it was caused by the serpent, that is, uh, Satan, and his plan for this planet. So when we look at um, the story in Exodus, and when Moses, who is now called to lead a people, and God is going to establish a people that's going to show the rest of the world what his kingdom is like, what his laws are like. So we have in Exodus 15:26. He says, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So a couple things here. We see number one, God is giving a structure, a, a, gr a group of laws that will help protect the Israelites from sickness. Number two, it says he will also heal them. That is, once they enter this covenant with him and they begin to keep these laws, that he also becomes their healer. And he either uh, just protects them completely from disease or even when they get disease, he heals them. So what were these laws? What were these, what was this system that he was talking about? So let's just go through them rather quickly. And we'll look at uh, the first one we'll talk about are in Leviticus 11, where he gives laws for clean and unclean meats. Now, this was not just a random list of animals that God just randomly went through creation and just said, well, that one looks like unclean, and it's ceremonial unclean, and we really don't know why, and it's kind of superstitious, don't touch it. No, absolutely not. There's nothing superstitious or ritualistic about this list. Modern science has proved that the animals on this list uh, they carry disease. They're either carnivores, they're scavengers, they're bottom feeders in, in the waters. They're just flat out not healthy. So when, you know, if we look at the Old Testament, we should never just say, well, you know, oh, you know, pork is the one that seems to get brought up the most in, in circles of believers. Um, as, you know, oh, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, let's just look at it for what it really is. It's just, it's not healthy. It's not good for you. And God, in his kindness to mankind and his desire for them to be healthy, because this is what he just told in Exodus 15 to Moses and the Israelites, you know, I'm going to keep you from diseases that the Egyptians have, so don't eat these animals. Why? Because they'll get you sick. Leviticus 3.17 goes on. He says, you shall eat neither the fat nor the blood. So, I mean, this is basically rules for kosher meat. Well, guess what? What carries, uh, you know, pathogens and disease in animals? It's the blood. So when we eat the blood, guess what we're getting? We're getting whatever they were sick with. And then we're also getting the fat. And this is interesting. Both the blood and the fat were not to be eaten. Now, if you have been through a CHIP program or are going through a CHIP program, um, 
you will know that almost every night we kind of repeat ourselves because we talk a lot about atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries, which only comes from animal products when the formation of cholesterol and it gets in our arteries and it begins to, to close the walls down and the, that hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller of what the heart is pumping the blood through and until sometimes there's 90%, sometimes 100% blockage of these arteries. Now, where does this come from? What they're proving today in modern science is that if you eat a plant-based diet, food as grown, you can actually reverse this process and open those arteries up. Whereas if you eat a high fat, high protein, animal-based uh, diet, animal product based I should say, um, you're going to start to close down those arteries. Well, guess what? Here's a law. Leviticus 3.17, where God was trying to get rid of atherosclerosis in his people. And we can see this in the example of Daniel. Daniel went on a diet of pulse and water. Now, I've always wondered pulse, you know, because we talk about pulses, you know, how fast your heart beats. But really, I went back and looked at that word in the Hebrew, and that word is based on the word for seed. Well, where did we meet seed-based plants? We'll go back and read Genesis 1. This is where God says, I'm making seed uh, trees that bear seeds, fruits that bear seeds, vegetables that bear seeds, and these seeds will produce their kinds, and we'll have all these seeds that are growing, and those are, that's your food. So when you read the story of Daniel, you really see, even in the Hebrew, you're going back to the story of Genesis chapter 1. You're going back to the way God originally intended the diet. Daniel does this, and he becomes ten times Wiser, smarter, healthier looking, healthier uh, inside. Of course, we, uh, you know, the Bible didn't really talk about <laughs> the, the closure of their arteries or anything. But we see the visible effects that it had. They thought better, they felt better, they looked better. So we see that example. Now, some of you can even go out and buy Ezekiel 4.9 bread. This is from biblical instruction. Uh, you know, Ezekiel was instructed to make a nutritious bread from wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. This was a multi-grain bread that was high in carbohydrates for energy, had a lot of fiber and protein. Fiber to help clean out the body, protein to help our muscles rebuild, and carbohydrates for energy. That is, God gave instructions to hair, eat this healthy bread. And he's actually trying to help us live healthfully. Solomon, Solomon said, use sweet sparingly. Don't be a glutton. He says, if you're going to be a glutton, just put your uh, knife to your throat. Don't eat too much. All good health advice. Solomon it was granted wisdom from on high. If we go back to uh, Hebrew law, baby males were to be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, modern medicine has shown that blood, the blood clotting mechanism in, in uh, developing uh, babies is not fully developed until the eighth day which is exactly when God said they can do this procedure, which there's a lot of bleeding, which the blood needs to clot in order to heal the wound. But also for people in uh, especially arid climates, this reduces urinary tract infections in boys, lower rates of penile uh, cancer for boys, and also cervical cancer for women. So we see that circumcision was not only a symbol of the Jewish nationhood and being a follower of the God of Abraham, it was also just a good health practice uh, for young boys and also helpful even for women. Now, there are other health laws, for instance, and we're not going to go through all of them. Leviticus 13 through 15 has a whole bunch of them. But basically, we'll just talk about the categories of these health laws. There was mandatory washing after you touched a dead person or dead animal or, for instance, clothes of a sick person. That, that is, there was some concept of, um, you know, pathogens and um, germs, basically, which people back then didn't even understand. Contam contaminated clothes were either to be washed if they could be remedied or burned if they couldn't. Dwellings that had mold or if there were sick people in them, they were either to be destroyed or cleaned or repaired, depending on uh, the case. And actually the priests were supposed to go and inspect it and look for it. And tattoos and cuttings on the flesh were prohibited. And modern medicine has proven that t tattoos and are 
health risks when you get a tattoo in our culture from the ink or the uh, needle of passing different diseases to us. Deuteronomy 23, 9 through 14 actually said that human waste was to be buried away from human dwellings. That is, there was some type of sanitary waste disposal. So we see that God was actually giving the Jewish nation this progressive, very enlightened understanding of public health. Uh, for instance, quarantining people, for instance, which we just saw, or, or, human, or, or sanitary waste disposal, a proper method of it so that it doesn't uh, you know, endanger people's lives and their, their health with it. And then I also want to bring up Sabbath, because Sabbath was given in the commandment, as probably you could say all the commandments help to bring some type of health. But one of the things we're finding is that a modern, stressful life is not good for our bodies. And here God gave the Jewish nation a weekly vacation. One day, mandatory, no work. Spend time with God, spend time with family, spend time with friends. That's great. It's a great, uh, I wouldn't even say counsel, it's a law. Can you imagine God put that into his law? Jesus actually said, you know, Sabbath isn't for God, it's for man. God made Sabbath for man. That's the purpose of it. it it's, it's to allow somebody to experience what grace is. That is, I don't have to work. I don't have to do something and everything's going to be fine. That is, I can trust God enough that I don't have to hurry, bustle about, and do all this stuff so that I'm not, not going to be able to put food on the table for my family. But I take a day off and it's okay. I'm experiencing God's grace. I can spend time with him, my family, and not work, and everything will be fine. Now, I want to go back now <clears throat> to the text in Exodus 15 where it said, if the Jews in that time were going to obey the laws that God gave them, that they would not have the same diseases as the Egyptians. So, we ask ourselves, well, what kind of diseases did the Egyptians have? Well, it is not, no longer a mystery. Uh, Dr. Gregory Thomas, the medical director at Long Beach Memorial, and his team of doctors, they've examined 76 Egyptians from 3,000 years ago, 51 Peruvians from 600 to 2,000 years ago, five Native Americans from 1,600 years ago, a small group of 500-year-old Mongolians, and five Aleutian Islanders from 150 years ago, and they did see CAT scans on all of them. And here's a picture of one. And this is what he says after doing this. There is a surprising similarity in the amount and distribution of atherosclerotic calcifications, fatty deposits, between Egyptians and current Americans of a similar age. Now he's referring to the Egyptians, but he also clarifies later in this article that they found uh, atherosclerosis in all these groups of people, from Peru, from here in, amongst Native Americans and people in the, in the islands and Mongolians, it didn't matter. All of them had fatty deposits. Their arteries were starting to shrink. Uh, that is uh, the passageways for the blood. And they were going to be suffering from what we are suffering from. You know, America, every year in America, heart disease is the, is the biggest killer. Over half a million people disappear off the face of the planet because of heart disease in our country, which if you go back to one of the root causes of heart disease, it's when there's atherosclerosis and your heart has to work harder to pump the blood through. Well, guess what? God had given a rule, a law, not eating fat or blood, that would have protected the Jews from this disease for the most part. What were some of the other diseases of the Egyptians? Oh, well, there was plague, uh, polio, influenza, smallpox. They're also known to have been in Egypt. And in fact, they looked at Nacht, who was a teenage boy in Thebes about uh, 3,000 years ago. And he was infected with four parasites, including tapeworm, malaria, and TB. Now this is what Degre Dr. Gregory Thomas says. These ancient people were unaware of the germs lurking, I like that word, lurking, in the unhygienic environments 
in which they lived, animals and people living side by side, inadequate sewage, and contaminated water. Now, just go back to all those rules that we just looked at for, for the Jews. Dr. Gregory Thomas says it perfectly. There were enemies lurking there in the environment, trying to kill the Egyptians. God, when he brings the Jews out of Israel, tells them, you know what, I'm giving you these rules so that those enemies lurking at you, whether it be heart disease, whether it be uh, malaria or tapeworms or any kind of virus or, or parasite or pathogen that's going to try to eat away at our bodies. He said, you're not going to have the same diseases. I'm, I, I will keep you from them. Now that's beautiful. So we jump ahead to when Jesus came. And what did Jesus say he came to do? He said he came to fulfill the law in Matthew chapter 5. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Well, what was the fulfillment of the law? It was being healthy. Guess what Jesus did most of the time on, on the planet here? Yeah, he preached some, but the vast majority of his time he visited with people trying to heal their emotional wounds and their, their sin-sick souls, relieving them of guilt, which is one of the greatest drivers of, of sickness. And he healed people. He healed lepers, the blind, people that had fevers, internal bleeding, and he even raised the dead. So as Paul says in Romans, I mean, the law is holy, just, and good. When God gave the law in the Old Testament, this was a wonderful thing. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled it. How did he fulfill it? He came and he brought physical health. But more than that, why was he just healing the body? See, we can be a healthy sinner and we can sin against God and still have guilt and still not go in God's order. But Jesus healed. And then he told people, you know, don't go and sin anymore. That is, he gave people the power to obey. And he took, as Isaiah 53 says, he took the punishment that we deserve. You know, Jesus' mission, you can just sum it up in these words. I love this text from John 10.10. 10. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What is the full? Well, the full is partly physical health. God wants us to be physically healthy. But he also wants us to be emotionally healthy and spiritually healthy. That is full, all kinds of health, holistic health. You see, when Jesus healed human beings and their, their physical bodies, he was really pointing forward to what Martin Luther, and this year we're also celebrating Martin Luther's uh, 500 year anniversary of when he posted the 95 Thesis on Wittenberg. And one of those theses was that we are saved by Christ's righteousness, that it's not our own. Isaiah 53, as I just mentioned, says, by his stripes, that is the punishment he got upon him, we are healed. Jesus took it upon himself so that we might live healthy lives, so that we might live to the full. Because really, when you think about it, you know, all of us in CHIP, we're still, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back, we're still going to die. Yeah, we will have a better life. We'll have, hopefully have a longer life. We'll feel better. But we're not completely restored. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, there will come a moment when it will happen like that. In the twinkling of an eye, when we'll get new bodies, when we'll get immortal bodies. And these will be gifts to us from Christ. When does that happen? It happens at the second coming. It happens at the great, that great moment that our church has been teaching. And even when we picked a name for ourselves, we included it in our name, Adventists. We're looking forward to the advent of Jesus. That is that moment when really we will get receive the fulfillment. Yeah, we have life to the full here in a sense, but we're still in a sinful world. There is a restoration that is coming that is complete. 
And yes, God heals us now of diseases. Why? So that we can enjoy life now and be assured that the, uh, the ultimate fulfillment will occur. You see in the Bible, if you start off, and that's why I started with Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, everything was good. Nothing was bad. Then came sin, things went downhill. Jesus came, gives us a glimpse of hope. There's hope, and this is what the Bible says. In fact, that's why the second coming is called the, the blessed hope, the great hope of mankind. But when you get to the end of the Bible, you get to Revelation 21 and 22, you see how the Bible started in Genesis 1 and you see how it ends up in, in Revelation 21 and 22. And how does it end up? Another garden, sin is forever gone. There are no, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, and all tears are wiped away. You see, God wants to give us complete restoration. He wants to restore our health. He, wants, he gave these law, beautiful laws in the Old Testament to keep us healthy. And he sent Jesus so that we might be healed. He took whatever punishment that we deserve and put it on him so that we might have eternal life and might have eternal healing and eternal restoration. What a beautiful truth that is. What a beautiful God we serve. One who wants to be healthy now, tomorrow, and forever. May God bless you.